Are you tired of facing the exact same S tier comps and feel forced to reroll the same units over and over? Yone, Duelist, Kaisa, Senna, Aphelios. Is there anything you can do for AP lovers? Well, good news. In this episode of TFT Academy, we're going to break down the latest ways that people are playing AP reroll featuring duos of Zyra Janna or Soraka and Zoe. So if you love playing off meta or you're just tired of rerolling for the same units, I got just the thing. I call this AP duos. Uh, my wife calls it hot girls because it's just a bunch of girls that you roll for. And the core game plan is to always play around these five units, Zyra, Janna, Zoe, Soraka, and Diana, and then teching in support at level seven through Riven, Nico. And maybe sometimes instead of Nico, you kind of play a Lowey or maybe a Galio, or just kind of depends on your situation of what augments you hit and maybe even the Exalted. There's a lot of different ways that you can slice it. So just be more cognizant of what your actual win condition is. If you're rolling for two costs for Zyra, Janna, roll at level six. If you're playing for Zoe Soraka, roll at seven. And then when you add levels, you go for units like Rakan, Wukong, Annie, and Lee Sin. Annie's really good for the invoker that ties in with Janet to help more frontline. Altris, Rakan is just always good. Wukong is a heavenly unit, is always really good for the stats. And Lee Sin is like a nice vertical you could play for for Dragon Lords if you want to go for four Dragon Lords for the AoE stun. It's a very powerful way to stop units in the metagame right now because it's so burst oriented that the Dragon Lord AoE stun gives you that valuable time to get ahead of your opponent in terms of combat damage. This is just a summary of it though. There's a lot of different ways that you can actually play and package. And sometimes you even chase more than just Zyra. Janna, like maybe you end up playing Zyra Janna and then you hit Soraka 3 and you give her items as well and then maybe you're not just finding Diana 3 but uh, you hit like Alawi 3 and Nico 3 and you play a little bit more Arcanist slant it's a lot of different ways you can do it so that's what makes this composition really interesting let's talk a little bit about items items are always broken down into mana plus AP and if you have to choose two of a source it's usually double mana because that helps you cast more often and that usually synergizes better with a lot of augments that you have set up because you can usually stack a lot of more AP sources, whether it's team buffs, but you don't really get many sources of mana. There are a few like invokers as a team trade and a couple of things like cybernetic uplink and maybe some attack speed. But generally speaking, you can always stack a little bit more AP. And so you want to get those mana sources quickly. Shoujin Nash is a really good combo. Shoujin helps you cast. Nash just helps you attack speed and get to cast again and gives you AP stats. So it's a really good complementary source. But for Janice, she actually really likes Rage Blade as a secondary source instead of Nashers. But if you do end up playing Nashers on her, you could also just do the same exact thing. And Shoujin Nash is a very flexible build. In fact, I'm pretty sure all four of these really like it. I'm just trying to give you another opportunity to create Biss if you have things like Pandora's. Ultimately, though, if you have like the Janna build and you put it on Zyra, or you have the Zoe build and you put it on Soraka, and you have Soraka items and you put it on Janna's, it's really not that big of a deal as long as you just get itemization across the board. Diana always really wants defensive items like Bramble, Declaw, Redemption. You can also put Spark on her if you don't have Shiv on your back line. But also at the same time, just slam whatever items are available to you. This is also currently reflected in our tier list with Zoe and Soraka duo alongside Zyra and Janna duo. There's a ton of different augments and items that you can have as a combination that might be really good. So just play around whatever you can get. And we try to have the setup as if it can show you the different variations of who can carry. But in reality, if you're playing like Zyra carry, you're not going to get perfect Janna items. You might just give her things like Shiv, an extra Shoujin, and who knows, maybe like a Jewel Gauntlet. Same thing with like Zoe. If you do play Zoe Soraka though, I do tend to skew towards primarying Zoe because she can deal with things like Yone and really hard units to burst currently in the meta. But that may change. They might shift later on in the set to be primary Soraka. So just keep that in mind if you end up revisiting this a patch or two later. If you need more information, check out tftacademy.com where you have a little quick snapshot on how to play for this composition. And we'll have more updates, tweaking things like comps like this all the time. Augments are really interesting in this composition because they all can have profound impact on how your game ends up shaping up. So for example, if you have Pandora's items, you can always go for perfect items on everybody. And so you can kind of justify rolling for everything. You could justify rolling for Zyra and Janna and Soraka and Diana and Zoe and never level past seven to try to just get like three star everything. And that end up might be in comboing well if you get like an augment such as Infernal Contract because you can't go past seven to get a million gold. Triforce ends up leading to more source three costs. Caretaker's ally leans towards two costs. Two healthy leans towards two costs. We don't have it included, but three to crowd leans for three costs, so on and so forth. Just go with the ebb and flow. And remember, Exalted can really end up playing a big factor into your augments as well. There's also unit specific augments to keep in mind. Enter the Dragon for Janna, for example, can make her the primary carry. And then you play into the Dragon Lords, add Lee Sin, add Rakan, 
make sure you get that four to five dragon lord online don't forget about generic combat augments that are really good for spam caster compositions combat caster pumping up jeweled lotus these are all really good tiny but deadly as well i mean that one's uh just fun to play <laughs> and also really good in this composition especially if you're playing things like children nashers saint unite is really good for this composition because you end up activating a lot of two and three traits you get two altruist and two heavenly and two arcanist so you just Kind of get a lot of extra combat power, which is really nice across the board. And then learning spell is one of my favorites. It's a little bit of a hidden tech because a lot of people don't know how to play this augment. They just like, oh, I'll just get like scaling AP and maybe I play for like a certain carry. This is really good if you get like an early Janna or early Zyra because you can start getting that scaling AP early and build around them. The other prismatic I want to call out are item ones like Unleashed Arcana, which just gives you a bunch of AP items and helps you itemize a bunch of three stars. And same thing with Lucky Gloves, kind of the same concept. Unleashed Arcana and Lucky Gloves just help you get two items immediately onto a champion that are really good for them and then uh, helps you scale into the late game quicker. Let's hop on board with Team Liquid's Kuramax. Kuramax is a person who has advanced to the World Championship multiple times. He's been one of the longest competitors since set one and has made it to almost every single major regionals competition. And he's also even won one of the North American regionals back in set four. So he's a very well-established name. He starts off with Janna and the possibility of playing around Story Weavers. He is open to playing a lot of Yone as well, but he scouts and sees that the Exalted is a lot of two costs. He has Janna and Zyra, for example, as being too Exalted. And so in his mind, he's thinking, can I find a way to play Exalted and play around the two costs this game? as a really good excuse to reroll for these two costs. It's a Jax 2, and now we're instead going to try to see if we can play around a little bit of this Janus Star because we have AP items. And this is a really good nod of when you can be thinking about that reroll. Yes, you can go into the game thinking you want to hard force it, but his items are really good to lend himself towards AP reroll. He has an Archangels already, although I think the first time he want to slam would be a Rage Blade, so he's hoping for a bow. But he might end up slamming something else instead because the reality is you have to kind of be careful of your item economy. He calls Janna in the chat even before he he sees his augments but let's go ahead and break things down he starts off with sleight of hand which is a really good unit to play on if you have a powerful two-star unit that can utilize it really well and benefit from the stats that you get you know 200 health and 20 percent sack speed is a decent amount of combat power to one unit if you guys think about how powerful things were like these gloves on headliners in the previous set in set 10 sleight of hand is like similar in concepts giving that extra stat boost and those extra items so that a two-star unit can dominate and bully early so it's always a generically good pick in almost any situation sleight of hand is a lot weaker though if you're trying to lose streak and I don't know if Kerm is loose streaking right here. He does have a Jax too. He might be able to play around that. Keepers does become more awkward as you scale later into the game. So even though it can be pretty good early, later in the game, you want to separate Diana and Riven and Nico from your, your back line because it just makes you clump up too much for AoE. Crown Guard is actually really good, but I think you wouldn't pick Crown Guarded unless you have a second Crown Guard immediately so you can like double dip. If he had a Rod and a Vest, I think a Crown Guard is really powerful, but I think because he doesn't have that and he does need a reroll augments eventually to look for something else better like Too Healthy or Enter the Dragon or some of these other really powerful gold augments we talked about, you might just end up passing it because you got to reroll something here. You can't just pick one out of the three options immediately. Oh, this is really interesting. Kerm actually reroled into Pandora's items and everything must go. Now we talked about Pandora's item one, the Silver over tier augment pandora's items 2 is significantly weaker because you have to roll that completed item into something that you want to use so you might end up rolling that for a really long time and then the relative power level of what you give up for a silver and gold is just completely different tiers on silver you're giving up a minor power buff or you're giving up like one component right or like a random item for pandora's which is actually good enough to as a trade-off at gold tier though you're giving up things that are really powerful like hero augments or uh, the ability to fast nine or just really strong items and poor and pandora's items too is generally considered the weakest of all the pandoras so i don't know if i'm in love with that i think i'd rather just take sleight of hand and just guarantee that i have tempo because our items are already pretty good pandora's items would be much better if we had like you know sword glove bow and we had like a really awkward time slamming so maybe that's when i would consider it everything must go is actually so insane i just made a video about this about how op it is and the reality is he probably could pick this and just win the game if everything goes right because it's just three star everything the only drawback is he doesn't have a gold opener and everything must go is kind of awkward in the very beginning because you have to kind of spend your gold very wisely of when you level and the game plan isn't as straightforward as just get to eight and roll for four cost you kind of have to roll a little bit at six you kind of have to roll a little bit at seven you have to be very careful about it and so there's a little bit of trade-offs for that that being said if you play this augment to its full potential i'm convinced it's true average placements like in the ones like it has to be like a 1.8 to 1.9 average placement it's just so good i'm actually really curious what he's gonna pick Fuck off hand. 
I'm not going to take everything must go because I'm going to just get dizzy, bro. Shit. All right. So Kurum says, uh, quote, I don't want to take everything must go because I'm probably going to get way too dizzy. And that's fair. So just take what's guaranteed. It's not like he has a bad augment here. Side of hand is also really good, which brings us to another tip. Uh, stay in your comfort zone. If you do end up picking an augment you're unfamiliar with, you do have to accept the fact that you might end up getting a bottom placement, even though it's a really good augment, it's really good in the stats because you just don't have experience with it. And so Kurum says, hey, look, I, I probably don't know how to execute this. And sleight of hand is really straightforward, so I'm going to just go for that instead. I can respect that. A man who knows his own strengths and weaknesses. Kerm slammed a spark and a thieves gloves onto the jacks. I actually like the spark slam a lot onto Diana because you have to find something to do with the cloaks in these compositions. I think a lot of people will be slamming things like Archangels onto the Janna and then trying to play around cloak and the belt. But in reality, you really need shred no matter what. And if you commit that first tier into a shiv then you're stuck with rod cloak and belt anyways and then you're like well do i want spark and the shiv maybe in the very late stage of the game but not really early this is actually a really big intermediate slash advanced concept that i think a lot of players even at high ranks struggle with which is trying to plan around what components that they can play for the carousel so in this case tier and belt is way more open and flexible from the play around as opposed to cloak and belt which feels like it's always going to skew towards the front line this way he has versatility and if it's an encounter on the carousel which it's not but let's say in the future it is this gives him even more options okay on carousel he goes for a sword so now he has shojin as his first item and i think that's very versatile you want that mana generation because you need to cast doesn't matter how much your ability is awesome if you never cast because you don't have enough mana. One thing really curious is that Kurum actually decided to go for red Kale, the Talisman of Speed, as opposed to the blue Kale, which gives AP. I actually think that's a mistake because you want that extra AP burst. One thing that's really important to remember about these units are the traits that they have and whether or not they give them that combat boost. So the nice thing about Zoe is that she is an Arcanist. So by activating her, she kind of gets a little bit more AP if you build vertical Arcanist. But a unit like Janna does not have a way to innately build ability power into her. This means that she can't actually get stronger just by getting more Dragon Lords in or more Invokers in. They cast more often, but you don't get the actual scaling damage. And so having that blue Kale is actually really powerful. So that way you can get more AP scaling onto units like Janna. And that way she can actually be a real threat. The encounter gave us some gold and that's great because we want to reroll. We don't really want to win this fight either. So Kerms is busy planning his team. He's going to go for the steady units we talked about. Janna and Zyra as the two costs, Soraka and Zoe, Riven and Diana, plus Nico or Alawi, but it's most likely going to be Nico. You do have some flexibility, though. As you can see, he only kept like five, six units in, so he wants to still maintain some of that flexibility depending on what he hits. You could also play Sages if you get it. We talked about how you want AP sources. Getting more Sages into the board gives you more ability power for the back line. Item Pop gives us an Alawi, but we sell it to make gold, and we get a rod, glove, and a belt. That gives us the ability to slam Morello if we want. Zyra does have built-in wounding into her kit, so it's kind of like a good way to have anti-heal temporarily, but it doesn't scale very well into the late game because she only has one or two targets at a time. So Kurum does have the option of slamming or holding because he is on a four loss. He doesn't actually have to slam at the moment. In this case, losing just gives him more loose street gold so he can wait till his augment to make a decision. Going up against Yone, which is a comp that actually you can fight against if you have high enough burst because uh, Yone isn't able to kill the backline very quickly and you have such high AP burst, you might be able to kill him before he gets online. Let's take a look at his augments. Portable Forge gets the fall in an Outrist Crest. Outrist Crest is really interesting because it does give him the ability to scale and to get up to four altruist late game so one of his win conditions can be get to level eight find recon get four altruist and have a super tanky composition and then find a way to get altruist crest onto a support unit that's really powerful in this case he would probably play altruist on zyra and that way he has a ton of healing to his team because remember altruist crest has like that gunblade effect for the team gifts of the fallen is also okay generically good portal forge uh i guess there's some decent items that you can get but there's a large range and i don't want to be stuck in a spot where i miss because i hit almost all like 80 i get like gold collector and and death defiance and just things like that so out of all these i like outrace crest the most oh he rerolls all of them and he actually gets two insane ones he gets two healthy and combat caster those are also 
really good. So he chooses to reroll all of them. And I'm pretty sure it's got to be too healthy here because Combat Caster is fantastic, but too healthy. You're playing four two costs on the board. You want to reroll Janna. So I feel like this has to be it. All right, too healthy it is. And we're going to roll a little bit just to make sure we can stabilize. And I think this is really key. Make sure that you are stable. And also he was rolling for the Exalted because it's the two cost Exalted. So he's able to get extra combat power and EXP as well. It's all looking really good. Janna 2, Soraka 2, Riven 2. He's not rolling for Diana 2 because even though he wants Diana 3, the odds for 3 costs are lower. And he realizes that he's probably stable enough even though he has Zyra 1. Actually, he might end up losing because Vola Bear is disgusting. Oh my god. This, this is so crazy. I can't believe we lost this fight. But I mean, it's a really juice Vola Bear. It's Keeper's Vola Bear with 3 items. And it's a Volo Bear 1. How do we expect to kill it, right? Duos will probably get nerfed next patch, so don't worry. That's not going to be a thing all set. At least I hope not. Okay, so we lost that fight, but despite that loss, I think we're still pretty stable and our board looks really good. And this actually goes back to the team builder of why he didn't actually put in the core units that uh, is traditionally played because he wanted to play the Kiana for the Exalted. So that makes a lot of sense. Okay, we're going up against a Faded board that has Thresh 2 and RE2. It's it's actually got a lot going on. So the fact that we beat this Faded board is really nice. We got past a really tanky board to start things off. Goes for a Vest on the Carousel. A little bit interesting to me. I think I would have prioritized going for a Tier, but I think he wants to go for a Rage Blade guaranteed. So he just wants to save that Rod instead. Gets a Galio off the Carousel. He theoretically could level, but... I think we're trying to roll for two costs, right? So this is an instance where we don't want to actually preemptively level. And we want to roll instead at six. Also kind of tough because there's like Annie in the shop and you want to get that Invoker in. Is it worth dipping out of that Exalted? I feel like it's not worth because you still want to get the Exalted and the two healthy value. Looks like there's two Yone players. So yeah, this is a Challenger player lobby. All right. So I got multiple Yone players. <laughs> and from here, the game plan is pretty straightforward from Kerm. He's going to roll above 50, try to collect his units and get his team online full of two costs. Oh, interesting. He skips Zoe. That's probably because he can't fit Zoe right now and he wants to get the exalted in so it might be something he texts at level seven instead and i like that adaptation in this variation because he's not prioritizing zoe and sorak as his duo instead he's going for janna and zyra and trying to roll around two costs he's going to play a different way to get to seven usually the composition plays around zoe at six and then you tech in soraka at seven but i really like the variation that kerm's going for right now it's just the best with his board because the heavenly exalted is a really good combo to tie in with that kiana and also it's a Zoe 1, so it's going to be like one of those things where you play Zoe 1 and you're playing, you know, Zoe 1 and Story Weaver over Soraka 2. Soraka 2 is just a higher quality unit. We got a bow off of PvE. Oh my god, a 3 Zyrashov. What is this? Okay, well that helps. Although now we're starting to get bench locked a little bit, which is uh, kind of annoying. I, I would say we can give up on some of the 3 costs because we want to reroll 2 costs. And clearly he's trying to go for Riven 3 as well. Oh, interesting. We're going to go for Shojin Nashes and not Rage Blade. And instead we went for Steadfast heart sunfire and spark really interesting i kind of thought we were going to go for the rage blade shojin but instead we went for the shojin nashers okay let's see how this does because that's traditionally not how this comp is played let's take a look at his augments he's already hovering over reroll ascension because right now my eye is drawn towards that sage crest sage crest gives a lot of that ap and it gives us a vertical we want to build into here in the game we can play around wukong it's really nice and a way to boost overall the team's performance and it gives a diana which is kind of nice uh, I also didn't talk about Little Buddies, but we're not playing any 4 and 5 costs, so uh, Little Buddies is just completely off the board. And Ascension is not the combat power that you really want here. Interesting choice when he rerolls uh, options 1 and 3. He gets Heroic Grab Bag and Portable Forge. Portable Forge is the same problem as 3-2. We just kind of need a specific set of items. And also, not to mention, we kind of have three items ready on Diana and Janna, or at least we don't have a slot available on any of them, so... It's just going to be really hard to justify. Rogue Grab Bag, you could actually end up taking it, but I don't think we're in a spot where we're desperate enough to actually go for it. And Rogue Grab Bag is usually one, either to get really far ahead and then bleed out into like a top three, top four, or you're so desperate that you need to hit and stabilize, you can play for placements. And I don't think we're in that spot whatsoever. So I still like Sagecrest because it plays for higher ceiling. And most people just agree that Rogue Grab Bag is something that you play for uh, either at the very beginning of the game or the very end of the game if you actually absolutely need it okay so we're rolling find janna and now we hit riven three and we put the sage onto kiana and that makes sense because 
it doesn't really matter who holds sage it's a team-wide buff and now riven adds to our tankiness by having three star variants but the problem is riven's not exactly a tank she's actually a carry this is actually the visualized downside of going for riven three which is that she doesn't actually do a lot uh, many of the times. Hence why a lot of people don't go after her to prio it, but because Kerm is playing around a two cost, two healthy exalted setup, he's trying to get value off of ruling for all the two costs. We hit Janna and now we level to seven and we're rolling because we only want one Zyra. The odds for two costs are still pretty decent. That 30%, that's still fine enough. And leveling a seven, gives us another two cost we play atrox and we get bruiser in and so this is a variation of that composition we just talked about very cool i like it too healthy exalted getting a lot of value adapting our composition and showing flexibility off of the main comp that we even showed you on tft academy in my slides and look at how difficult it is to deal with this comp now that we hit janna three she's online she's casting a lot yes we're not playing scaling janna and yet it's still getting the job done and we don't have to have that scaling because they exalted just gives us that more power and the more we're and the more levels we're pushing the more damage we're getting anyways would love for them to take the zyra it's a three-star zyra plus it's archangels it's like everything you want here i do think some some scaling would be nice for Janna. So that is the Zyra 3. We have the Archangels and we have the potential Tekken for like Lee Sin or Story Weaver. I think I like Story Weaver better because the Bruiser is nice for the Kale and gets us a little bit of attack speed. And that attack speed actually is kind of nice because we have our AP sort of squared away. We have Sage to give us more bonus AP and we have Archangels that scales us. So in a way, this is actually not a bad use of the red Janna. And look at that. We just dealt with Yone 2 very easily. This is a pretty good Heavenly Yone setup. And we just took care of it like it was no big deal whatsoever. And now that we're at seven, we're probably gonna stay at seven and roll until we hit things like Diana 3. Soraka 3 is not the priority. Uh, we didn't really play around Zoe because we're playing around the Riven and the Galio instead. Kaisa and Silas on the other side. That is another really powerful duo. Let's see if we can withstand the burst here. And look at the shielding from Janna as well. Just kind of protecting these units. Oh my god. We just beat a souped up Kaisa board as well. We get dropped a support item anvil, which uh, we can honestly take anything to improve our front line. Oh my God, speaking of front line, we just got Wukong. So we take Aegis and we put it on Wukong. Take a tier for the Shoujin. So we just give leftover items to Zyra. Aegis does have a, a neat trick you can do. Uh, Aegis buffs 2-3-2 two, two behind it. What that means is the two hexes behind the Aegis will get buffed, but then the three hexes in the third row will get buffed so there is a possibility that if you want to max greed you can move everything up one and go for like janna kale zyra he's kind of playing some backpack battles tetris right now trying to figure out like how he wants to look at his board with aegis and whatnot if he wants to greed full value i personally think it is worth giving the attack speed to janna i see so he ends up moving the kale a little bit over just so he can get the attack speed onto janna so he doesn't want to move up his backline to be more vulnerable he's not going for max greed which i think is totally reasonable instead buffs janna and zyra and now what was once a difficult composition deal with Volibear, which he lost multiple times against. It's now looking like a piece of cake, and now we're off to the races. Kerm can push to level nine. He doesn't actually have to roll for Diana. I actually walked that statement back. I was thinking about it and it's like, well, you know, he could roll for Diana three here, but reality is the star of the composition are the two costs and he doesn't necessarily have to go for Diana three. So he picked up that Wukong and then decided to level instead, which I think is a really good adaptation. And that's kind of what's really cool. Just going with the ebb and flow of whatever is happening in the game because encounters and portals, there's so many different ways that might change your game plan. This is Yone three with a cane two and the Yone three fall Looks like yet another Yone player that might be biting the dust. Do we have the Yone counter composition right in front of our very eyes? We have four Sage. We might be going for a fifth Sage at level nine. We also can play Rakan for another Altruist. You also could take that Lissandra, by the way, and just play Lissandra. Oh, he takes an Invoker Emblem, so he gets a little bit more mana. Okay, I can see that too. I wonder what we're rolling for. Maybe like a Galio 2. Sandra is kind of tempting as well. Part of the reason why I really like Lissandra in this setup is because she ends up being really good for anti hyper carry or like a super tank. Like in the late stages of the game, that is one way you can deal with Yone by hitting Lissandra and then like sniping Yone or dealing with like that Amumu 3 or whatever unkillable tanks in the front, that solo front line. 
Lissandra can deal with it. And that is a really good thing for like these Janna and other units to, to have to get past that frontline unit. Here comes the encounter. Kindred offers a temporary item, probably another item for Zyra. Aj looks good to me. I see. So Kuram wants to rule at level eight because he still wants to hit Diana three. I think he kind of recognized his frontline is pretty fraudulent. So going to nine was not going to be good enough. I see. So a lot of like ebb and flow, like, okay, I'm going to over level to get a really good unit in and then roll at the slightly suboptimal level to get my three star. Right, he went to seven and then he hit Zyra three. He went to eight and now he's trying to get to Diana three. That's another adaptation of his game plan. Going up against the Kaisa board, and that Kaisa is level nine with Lucky Ricochet. Does have the Zaya. Very powerful composition. And yet we're dealing with it. Looks like we win. Oh my god, so close. Wow, we're going toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the best comps in the entire meta. So if, if you're not convinced by now, then I don't know what will. There's a scary Shen 6 Behemoth comp with Ethereal Blades. Okay, we are going to roll and see if we can hit that Diana 3. And this is actually a really important thing as well to note, is that all throughout this game, we have been kind of like not able to go for Diana 3 because the Duelist players were threatening us. But uh, one thing to note is that if there are other players holding Dianas, chances are you can't go for Diana 3 very easily. Another Yone face-off. And Yone is just completely evaporated. Cannot get past all of the shielding. Cannot deal with all the bursts. And that's not one but two Yones that are going to be going bot four. Going against the Duelist player. And this Duelist player actually did not have Dianas. Never mind. So that's partially why I think he could go for Diana three. Vola Bear three is on our back line. And I think that this is a positioning dev. I think, unfortunately, we lost because... Volibear got access to our back line, so Kerm has to be a little bit more careful about that. The way he was positioned in this fight allowed Volibear to wrap entirely around, so if he tucked it a little bit into the corner, units like Diana would not have been interfered with and uh, would have been immediately stuck. Okay, so we're repositioning closer to the center, so instead of moving further away from that, we're moving closer but making sure Diana can tank. That's also fine. Just making sure to reposition so that way he doesn't get caught like that again. Going against the ghost of the player with Shen. And it looks like we do end up beating the ghost player pretty handily. Tatsuko lost versus Xiao Dian Dian. Going for a third item, I think, here for Zyra would be huge. Another Shoujin. I think that makes sense. Shoujin, Shoujin is totally fine for Zyra. That's three autos, and I think she casts. Now we're at nine. Let's see if we can hit things like two-star Wukong, two-star Rakan. Three-star Diana. Okay, Rakan 2 is big. And Diana 3 is also really big. That's very big. Now our front line is much stronger. At this phase of the game, Diana 2 is way too weak, and Diana 3 is infinitely stronger. He tries to reposition because he doesn't want Diana to get focused by Shen. Shen has a lot of true damage bursts, and so he wants Diana to stay a little bit safer, so he moves her a little bit back. Nice little reposition. Gets the advantage and completely takes down the Shen. Going up against Setsuko in the 1v1, Setsuko has the three-star duelists. Last time the Volibear wrapped onto our units, what are we going to do this time? I mean, I think we pretty much just have to get the units stuck on Diana. I think uh, moving Diana up one makes sense here to me, unless he wants to avoid things like the Lee Sin. Ah, so he tidies up. Yeah actually makes it so that way they bunch a little bit more and Soraka can get the AoE Mana Reeve onto the Volibear. And it looks like the Volibear is down this time. And oh my gosh, it's so close. Dude, this third item Zyra is actually so clutch. Now the Zyra is out damaging the Janna. I mean, that makes sense because Zyra survived a lot longer, but uh, now it's really showing you the importance of having dual carry. You can't just do it with one unit alone. If you just put all in on Janna and you don't have Zyra, you all in on Zoe, you don't have Soraka, you're just going to struggle a little bit in these late game fights. All right, so now we're going to roll and see if we can hit Wukong 2, which would be huge. We have more Ghana 2 in the shop, but I think it's going to be hard to give up things like the Exalted and our 4 Dragon Lord. 4 Dragon Lord is really nice because you get a big stun for the whole board, and that could be huge. Goes for Crown Guard onto Rakan. Rakan with items is also really good. Adds to the tankiness and does a little bit of damage. This fight looks like it's going way better this time. And I think that should be it because I think now it's just proven that uh, we're too strong and we hit Wukong too. That's way too much for this duelist board to deal with. And so you're telling me we took down two Yones, two Kaisa players, a Shen at full power, and Duelist. That's pretty much the top comps of the metagame right now. Well, maybe not Shen, but the rest do count. Tetsuko desperately tries to go for a side swap, hoping that maybe this wraparound angle could be better. That Dragonlord stun is just keeping all the duelists held down. And there you have it. First place with Janna Zyra reroll. I think that Exalted and Two Healthy helped a lot, but shows you a lot of the versatility and power of this composition. So that's the AP reroll in a nutshell. The duos between Zyra, Janna, or Zoe and Soraka, and everything in between. Have fun experimenting and definitely try to push the limits of what you think could be good. There's probably even more variations we didn't even talk about in this video. I think the line has a lot to offer. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time.